Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and one reason I studied the Civil War is because it was a turning point in United States history. Social hierarchies were overturned, economic and political relationships were ripped apart and new ones formed, our ideas about government changed, and the way we thought about one another as citizens of the United States took on whole different meanings. One of those changes I want to discuss in this video is how the Civil War changed the relationship between Southern women and the government, both on the state and national level. When the Southern states left the Union and began forming their own country, the Confederate States of America, their intention was to create a white man's slaveholder republic. Alexander Stevens, Vice President of the Confederacy, stated that the original Union rested on the assumption of the equality of the races. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Within this political sphere, the only people to possess political power were white men. They were the voters and the office holders. A Georgia state legislature and future Confederate General Thomas R. R. Cobb stated before a crowd of people that this constitution was made for white men, citizens of the United States. These secessionists believed that electing Abraham Lincoln would usher in voting rights for black men who would elect politicians to rule over them, therefore giving African American men political power. One aspect of secession was to fight against the possible loss of political power to African Americans and to guard against emancipation of their slaves, which they saw as ruinous to their social, economic, and political institutions. One topic in many secessionist speeches was their insistence on protecting their women from marauding freed African American men, and the only way to safeguard against that would be to break away from the Union to create their own country. Women were seen as something to protect, but nothing to offer the government of political value. Women were excluded from the body politic in the South, and it wasn't much better in the North, but because women had linked their rights with the fight against slavery in the North, they were making inroads. Though small they might have been, they were still pushing towards gaining suffrage. In the South, with no anti-slavery organizations to link their suffrage movement to, Southern women were not seen as active citizens of the nation. Once married, their political representation rested on their husband and his ability to vote. However, the war would change the role of women to the federal government and the state governments of the Confederacy. As historian Stephanie McCurry explained, in ways no one anticipated at the outset, the deeply held assumptions about women's nature and proper role collided with a historically contingent set of developments bearing on their political behavior in the war. Indeed, for government officials and military men on both sides of the contest, the Civil War involved a series of startling confrontations with women engaged in what could only be called political acts. For Southern women, War was ever present in their lives, especially because northern armies from the outset began occupying and infiltrating parts of the south. This and other reasons gave rise to women inserting themselves into southern politics. Before the war, women had been of little interest to state officials. Their business was with their husbands, brothers, and fathers. In many ways, the war thrust southern women into the political sphere. This is not to say that the southern government did not acknowledge that women played a significant role in the nation. They did, especially when it came to the making of uniforms and especially flags, which were presented to units and politicians alike. They even contributed to the economy through the sale of goods that they made or grew. However, they were not thought of as members of the political community. They changed drastically when the war began to drag on through the end of 1861 and the Confederate government issued the Conscription Act to draft men into the army. The social contract between men and the government was that if the government was put in danger, male citizens would fight to protect it in exchange for protection of the men's property and subsequently families. As their husbands mustered into Confederate ranks, women got a new political label, not just wife, but soldier's wife which came with a whole new definition and relationship to the government. State governments pledged the men enlisted in their military units that they would safeguard their loved ones at home as they went off to fight. This new status of women gave them enormous political power because now women could use their husband's status as protector of the government to lobby for protection and help during the war. This upended the political fabric of the South. This was a historic moment in women's history and United States history, as Southern women demanded help from the government once the government took their husbands away. 
the prolonged military service of the men or their death placed women on the home front in desperate situations. Out of love and survival, women wanted their husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons back home. And all over the South, they started letter writing campaigns to public officials in mass. This had never been done before by Southern women. Such a large amount of coordinated and independent dialogue between the women of the state and governors and other state officials. One way they appealed to officials was to emphasize the danger and taking away the male citizens from the community because they were the safeguards against slave insurrections. They pleaded with officials to send their loved ones back home to secure not only their families but the national government by stamping out any internal slave rebellion. Without a head of the household, women called on the Confederate government or state governments to do various things like lower taxes or control inflation. Local officials arrested a woman who threatened a miller for charging exorbitant prices and not taking the Confederate money that her husband was paid in. Her and other women wrote to officials to regulate the prices and would take matters into their own hands by physically attacking businessmen or government officials. She warned her governor that she knew deserters who would help her make things right. Confederate officials desperately looking for ways to clothe and feed the armies imposed a taxing kind that would further hurt women at home who saw their crops get taken away by tax in kind men who were dispatched to round up the supplies from local communities. One southern lady asked, do we women have to pay tithes when our husbands are in the war? Nancy Richardson told Governor of North Carolina Zebulon Vance that if the women had to pay the taxes, our husbands intend to die at home, that they are just waiting for the tax to be taken from us, and they will desert as soon as it is done. Some women became not only anti-war, but anti-slavery as the war raged on. A poor woman from North Carolina wrote Governor Vance that, I believe slavery is doomed to die out, and that God is going to liberate blacks, and fighting any longer is fighting against God. Now, sir, you and some of the rest of those big bugs will have to answer for the blood of our dear ones who have been slain. God will demand their blood at your hands. The pressure of war and fighting for survival forced women to not only write letters to affect public policy, but to use violence as a way to have their political voices heard. Most people have heard of the Richmond bread rights, but that is one instance. There are many more, probably more than we know of. Mobs of women, numbering from a dozen to three hundred and more, armed with navy revolvers, pistols, repeaters, bowie knives, and hatchets, carried out at least twelve violent attacks on stores, government warehouses, army convoys, railroad depots, salt works, and granaries. These attacks were a response to the harsh taxation policies placed on families by the Confederate government, and women now taking on the role of the head of household to secure subsistence as more and more men left the home. Many of them were left without a means to survive, and those that did suffered from heavy taxation that took the crops that they did grow. Although Richmond was the largest ride, it was not the first. The first one took place in Atlanta, Georgia in March 1863. Between 15 and 20 women joined together, led by a tall lady, and moved through the downtown streets of Atlanta. They stopped in front of a provision store on White Hill Street and entered the store and the tall lady asked the merchant how much bacon was. He told her a dollar ten cents a pound. She exclaimed that the women in her position could not afford food at such a large price and drew a long pistol from her bosom and held the merchant at gunpoint while the other women pillaged the store. By midday, all the women had melted back into the crowd and were never caught. These demonstrations and riots signaled to the government officials the problems in supplying an army for the war and balancing the war efforts with maintaining the security of families on the home front. The letters and actions taken by women without the ability to vote resulted in local, state, and national legislation that relieved the families impacted by the war. The Confederacy created a welfare system, not seen in American history up to that point, in an attempt to keep the peace among its citizens who are bearing a large portion of the misery brought on by the Civil War. So well organized and powerful was the Confederacy from a bureaucratic and controlling standpoint that one historian has argued that the United States would not see a central government with comparable authority until the emergence of the New Deal in the 20th century. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, where do you roam?
historian, historian, far, far from home. As history will travel, reads the card of a man, a professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world is his mission. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian